This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Twenty Thousand Leagues Under the Seas by Jules Verne. First Part, Chapter 14 The Black Current. The part of the planet Earth that the seas occupy has been assessed at 3,832,558 square myriameters, hence more than 38 billion hectares. This liquid mass totals 2,250,000,000 cubic miles, and could form a sphere with a diameter of 60 leagues, whose weight would be 3 quintillion metric tons. To appreciate such a number, we should remember that a quintillion is to a billion what a billion is to one. In other words, there are as many billions in a quintillion as ones in a billion. Now then, this liquid mass nearly equals the total amount of water that has poured through all the Earth's rivers for the past 40,000 years. During prehistoric times, an era of fire was followed by an era of water. At first, there was ocean everywhere. Then, during the Silurian period, the tops of mountains gradually appeared above the waves. Islands emerged disappeared beneath temporary floods, rose again, refused to form continents. And finally the Earth's geography settled into what we have today. Solid matter had wrested from liquid matter some 37,657,000 square miles, hence 12,916,000,000 hectares. The outlines of the continents allow the seas to be divided into five major parts, the frozen Arctic and Antarctic oceans, the Indian Ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, and the Pacific Ocean. The Pacific Ocean extends north to south between the two polar circles, and east to west between America and Asia, over an expanse of 145 degrees of longitude. It's the most tranquil of the seas. Its currents are wide and slow-moving, its tides moderate, its rainfall abundant. And this was the ocean that I was first destined to cross under these strangest of auspices. If you don't mind, Professor, Captain Nemo told me, We'll determine our exact position and fix the starting point of our voyage. It's fifteen minutes before noon. I'm going to rise to the surface of the water. The captain pressed an electric bell three times. The pumps began to expel water from the ballast tanks. On the pressure gauge, a needle marked the decreasing pressures that indicated the Nautilus's upward progress. Then the needle stopped. Here we are, the captain said. I made my way to the central companionway, which led to the platform. I climbed its metal steps, passed through the open hatches, and arrived topside on the Nautilus. The platform emerged only eighty centimeters above the waves. The Nautilus's bow and stern boasted that spindle-shaped outline that had caused the ship to be compared appropriately to a long cigar. I noted the slight overlap of its sheet-iron plates, which resembled the scales covering the bodies of our big land reptiles. So I had a perfectly natural explanation for why, despite the best spy glasses, this boat had always been mistaken for a marine animal. Near the middle of the platform, the skiff was half set in the ship's hull, making a slight bulge. Fore and aft stood two cupolas of moderate height, their sides slanting and partly inset with heavy biconvex glass, one reserved for the helmsman steering the Nautilus, the other for the brilliance of the powerful electric beacon lighting his way. The sea was magnificent, the skies clear. This long aquatic vehicle could barely feel the broad undulations of the ocean. A mild breeze out of the east rippled the surface of the water. Free of all mist, the horizon was ideal for taking sights. There was nothing to be seen, not a reef, not an islet, no more Abraham Lincoln, a deserted immenseness. Raising his sextant, Captain Nemo took the altitude of the sun, which would give him his latitude. He waited for a few minutes until the orb touched the rim of the horizon. While he was taking his sights, he didn't move a muscle, and the instrument couldn't have been steadier in hands made out of marble. Noon, he said. Professor, whenever you're ready. I took one last look at the sea, a little yellowish near the landing places of Japan, and I went below again to the main lounge. There the captain fixed his position and used a chronometer to calculate his longitude which he double-checked against his previous observations of our angles. Then he told me, Professor Aranax, we're in longitude 137 degrees, 15 minutes west. West of which meridian? I asked quickly, hoping the captain's reply might give me a clue to his nationality. 
sir, he answered me. I have chronometers variously set to the meridians of Paris, Greenwich, and Washington, D.C., but in your honor, I'll use the one for Paris. This reply told me nothing. I bowed, and the commander went on. We're in longitude 137 degrees, 15 minutes west of the meridian of Paris, and latitude 30 degrees, 7 minutes north, in other words, about 300 miles from the shores of Japan. At noon on this day of November 8, we hereby begin our voyage of exploration under the waters. May God be with us, I replied. And now, Professor, the captain added, I'll leave you to your intellectual pursuits. I've set our course east-northeast at a depth of 50 meters. Here are some large-scale charts in which you'll be able to follow that course. The lounge is at your disposal, and with your permission, I'll take my leave. Captain Nemo bowed. I was left to myself, lost in my thoughts. They all centered on the Nautilus's commander. Would I ever learn the nationality of this eccentric man, who had boasted of having none? His sworn hate for humanity, a hate that perhaps was bent on some dreadful revenge, what had provoked it? Was he one of those unappreciated scholars, one of those geniuses embittered by the world, as Conseil expressed it, a latter-day Galileo, or maybe one of those men of science, like America's Commander Maori, whose careers were ruined by political revolutions? I couldn't say yet. As for me, whom fate had just brought aboard his vessel, whose life he had held in the balance, he had received me coolly, but hospitably. Only he never took the hand I extended to him. He never extended his own. For an entire hour I was deep in these musings, trying to probe this mystery that fascinated me so. Then my eyes focused on a huge world map displayed on the table, and I put my finger on the very spot where our just-determined longitude and latitude intersected. Like the continents, the sea has its rivers. These are exclusive currents that can be identified by their temperature and color, the most remarkable being the one called the Gulf Stream. Science has defined the global paths of five chief currents, one in the North Atlantic, a second in the South Atlantic, a third in the North Pacific, a fourth in the South Pacific, and a fifth in the Southern Indian Ocean. Also, it's likely that a sixth current used to exist in the Northern Indian Ocean, when the Caspian and Aral Seas joined up with certain large Asian lakes to form a single, uniform expanse of water. Now then, at the spot indicated on the world map, one of these sea-going rivers was rolling by, the Kuroshio of the Japanese, the Black Current. Heated by perpendicular rays from the tropical sun, it leaves the Bay of Bengal, crosses the Strait of Malacca, goes up the shores of Asia, and curves into the North Pacific as far as the Aleutian Islands, carrying along trunks of camphor trees and other local items, the pure indigo of its warm waters sharply contrasting with the ocean's waves. It was this current the Nautilus was about to cross. I watched it on the map with my eyes. I saw it lose itself in the immenseness of the Pacific, and I felt myself swept along with it, when Ned Land and Conseil appeared in the lounge doorway. My two gallant companions stood petrified at the sight of the wonders on display. Where are we? the Canadian exclaimed. In the Quebec Museum? Begging master's pardon, Conseil answered, but this seems more like the Somerard Artifacts Exhibition. My friends, I replied, signaling them to enter, you are neither Canada nor France, but securely aboard the Nautilus, fifty meters below sea level. If master says so, then so be it, Conseil answered. But in all honesty, this lounge is enough to astonish even someone Flemish like myself. Indulge your astonishment, my friend, and have a look, because there's plenty of work here for a classifier of your talents. Kosai needed no encouraging. Bending over the glass cases, the gallant lad was already muttering choice words from the naturalist's vocabulary. Class Gastropoda, family Buchanoidea, genus Cowrie, species Cyprea madagascariensis, etc. Meanwhile, Ned Land, less dedicated to conchology, questioned me about my interview with Captain Nemo. Had I discovered who he was, where he came from, where he was heading, how deep he was taking us? In short, a thousand questions I had no time to answer. I told him everything I knew, or rather, everything I didn't know, and I asked him what he had seen or heard on his part. Haven't seen or heard a thing, the Canadian replied. I haven't even spotted the crew of this boat. By any chance, could they be electric too? Electric? Oh, ye gods, I'm half tempted to believe it. But back to you, Professor Aronnax, Ned Land said, still hanging on to his ideas. Can't you tell me how many men are on board? 
ten, twenty, fifty, a hundred? I'm unable to answer you, Mr. Land, and trust me on this. For the time being, get rid of these notions of taking over the Nautilus or escaping from it. This boat is a masterpiece of modern technology, and I'd be sorry to have missed it. Many people would welcome the circumstances that have been handed us just to walk in the midst of these wonders. So keep calm, and let's see what's happening around us. See, the harpooner exclaimed, there's nothing to see. Nothing we'll ever see from the sheet-iron prison. We're simply running around blindfolded. Ned Land was just pronouncing these last words when we were suddenly plunged into darkness, utter darkness. The ceiling lights went out so quickly my eyes literally ached, just as if we had experienced the opposite sensation of going from the deepest gloom to the brightest sunlight. We stood stock still, not knowing what surprise was waiting for us, whether pleasant or unpleasant. But a sliding sound became audible. You could tell that some panels were shifting over the Nautilus's sides. It's the beginning of the end, Ned Land said. Order Hydromedusa, Kosai muttered. Suddenly, through two oblong openings, daylight appeared on both sides of the lounge. The liquid masses came into view, brightly lit by the ship's electric outpourings. We were separated from the sea by two panes of glass. Initially I shuddered at the thought that these fragile partitions could break, but strong copper bands secured them, giving them nearly infinite resistance. The sea was clearly visible for a one-mile radius around the Nautilus. What a sight! What pen could describe it? Who could portray the effects of this light through these translucent sheets of water, the subtlety of its progressive shadings into the ocean's upper and lower strata? The transparency of salt water has long been recognized. Its clarity is believed to exceed that of spring water. The mineral and organic substances it holds in suspension actually increase its translucency. In certain parts of the Caribbean Sea, you can see the sandy bottom with startling distinctness as deep as 145 meters down, and the penetrating power of the sun's rays seems to give out only at a depth of 300 meters. But in this fluid setting, traveled by the Nautilus, our electric glow was being generated in the very heart of the waves. It was no longer illuminated water, it was liquid light. If we accept the hypotheses of the microbiologist Ehrenberg, who believes that these underwater depths are lit up by phosphorescent organisms, nature has certainly saved one of her most prodigious sights for residents of the sea, and I could judge for myself from the thousandfold play of the light. On both sides I had windows opening over these unexplored depths. The darkness in the lounge enhanced the brightness outside, and we stared as if this clear glass were the window of an immense aquarium. The Nautilus seemed to be standing still. This was due to the lack of landmarks, but streaks of water, parted by the ship's spur, sometimes threaded before our eyes with extraordinary speed. In wonderment we leaned on our elbows before these show windows, and our stunned silence remained unbroken until Kosai said, You wanted something to see, Ned, my friend? Well, now you have something to see. How unusual, the Canadian put in setting aside his tantrums and getaway schemes while submitting to this irresistible allure. A man would go an even greater distance just to stare at such a sight. Aha! I exclaimed. I see our captain's way of life. He's found himself a separate world that saves its most astonishing wonders just for him. But where are the fish? the Canadian ventured to observe. I don't see any fish. Why would you care, Ned, my friend? Conseil replied, since you have no knowledge of them. Me? A fisherman? Ned Land exclaimed. And on this subject a dispute arose between the two friends, since both were knowledgeable about fish, but from totally different standpoints. Everyone knows that fish make up the fourth and last class in the vertebrate branch. They have been quite aptly defined as cold-blooded vertebrates with a double circulatory system, breathing through gills, and designed to live in water. They consist of two distinct series the series of bony fish, in other words, those whose spines have vertebrae made of bone, and cartilaginous fish, in other words, those whose spines have vertebrae made of cartilage. Possibly the Canadian was familiar with this distinction, but Kosai knew far more about it, and since he and Ned were now fast friends, he just had to show off. So he told the harpooner, Ned, my friend, you're a slayer of fish, a highly skilled fisherman. You've caught a large number of these fascinating animals, but I'll bet you don't know how they're classified. Sure I do, the harpooner replied in all seriousness. They're classified into fish we eat, and fish we don't eat. 
Spoken like a true glutton, Conseil replied. But tell me, are you familiar with the differences between bony fish and cartilaginous fish? Just maybe, Conseil. And how about the subdivisions of these two large classes? I haven't the foggiest notion, the Canadian replied. All right, listen and learn, Ned, my friend. Bony fish are subdivided into six orders. Primo, the Acanthopterygians, whose upper jaw is fully formed and free-moving, and whose gills take the shape of a comb. This order consists of fifteen families, in other words, three-quarters of all known fish. Example, the common perch. Pretty fair eating, Ned Land replied. Secundo, Conseil went on, the abdominals, whose pelvic fins hang under the abdomen to the rear of the pectorals, but aren't attached to the shoulder bone, an order that's divided into five families and makes up the great majority of freshwater fish. Examples, carp, pike. Ugh, the Canadian put in with distinct scorn. You can keep the freshwater fish. Tertio, Conseil said, the Sabrachians, whose pelvic fins are attached under the pectorals and hang directly from the shoulder bone. This order contains four families. Examples, flatfish, such as sole, turbot, dab, place, brill, etc. Excellent, really excellent, the harpooner exclaimed, interested in fish only from an edible viewpoint. Quarto, Conseil went on, unabashed. The apods, with long bodies that lack pelvic fins and are covered by a heavy, often glutinous skin. An order consisting of only one family. Examples, common eels and electric eels. So-so, just so-so, Ned Land replied. Quinto, Conseil said, the Lophobranchians, which have fully formed, free-moving jaws, but whose gills consist of little tufts arranged in pairs along their gill arches. This order includes only one family. Examples, seahorses and dragonfish. Bad, very bad, the harpooner replied. Sexto and last, Conseil said, the Plectignaths, whose maxillary bone is firmly attached to the side of the intermaxillary that forms the jaw, and whose palate arch is locked to the skull by sutures that render the jaw immovable, an order lacking true pelvic fins, and which consists of two families, examples, puffers, and moonfish. They are an insult to a frying pan, the Canadian exclaimed. Are you grasping all this, Ned, my friend? asked the scholarly Conseil. Not a lick of it, Conseil, my friend, the harpooner replied. But keep going, because you fill me with fascination. As for cartilaginous fish, Conseil went on unflappably, they consist of only three orders. Good news, Ned put in. Primo, the cyclostomes, whose jaws are fused into a flexible ring, and whose gill openings are simply a large number of holes, an order consisting of only one family. Example, the lamprey. An acquired taste, Ned Land replied. Secundo, the Salacians, with gills resembling those of the cyclostomes, but whose lower jaw is free-moving. This order, which is the most important in the class, consists of two families. Examples, the ray and the shark. What? Ned Land exclaimed. Rays and man-eaters in the same order? Well, Conseil, my friend, on behalf of the rays, I wouldn't advise you to put them in the same fish tank. Tertio, Conseil replied. The Sturionians whose gill opening is the usual single slit adorned with the gill cover, an order consisting of four genera. Example, the sturgeon. Ah, Conseil, my friend, you saved the best for last, in my opinion, anyhow. And that's all of them? Yes, my gallant Ned, Conseil replied. And note well, even when one has grasped all this, one still knows next to nothing, because these families are subdivided into genera, subgenera, species, varieties. All right, Conseil, my friend the harpooner said, leaning toward the glass panel. Here comes a couple of your varieties now. Yes, fish, Conseil exclaimed. One would think he was in front of an aquarium. No, I replied, because an aquarium is nothing more than a cage, and these fish are as free as birds in the air. Well, Conseil, my friend, identify them. Start naming them, Ned Land exclaimed. Me, Conseil replied, I'm unable to. That's my employer's bailiwick. And in truth, Although the fine lad was a classifying maniac, he was no naturalist, and I doubt that he could tell a bonito from a tuna. In short, he was the exact opposite of the Canadian, who knew nothing about classification, but could instantly put a name to any fish. A triggerfish, I said. It's a Chinese triggerfish, Ned Land replied. Genus Belistes, family Scleroderma, order Plectognatha, 
Kosai muttered. Assuredly, Ned and Kosai in combination added up to one outstanding naturalist. The Canadian was not mistaken. Cavorting around the Nautilus was a school of triggerfish with flat bodies, grainy skins, armed with stings on their dorsal fins, and with four prickly rows of quills quivering on both sides of their tails. Nothing could have been more wonderful than the skin covering them, white underneath, grey above, with spots of gold sparkling in the dark eddies of the waves. Around them, rays were undulating like sheets flapping in the wind, and among these I spotted, much to my glee, a Chinese ray, yellowish on its top side, a dainty pink on its belly, and armed with three stings behind its eyes, a rare species whose very existence was still doubted in Lacode's day, since that pioneering classifier fish had seen one only in a portfolio of Japanese drawings. For two hours a whole aquatic army escorted the Nautilus. In the midst of their leaping and cavorting, while they competed with each other in beauty, radiance, and speed, I could distinguish some green wrasse, bewhiskered mullet marked with pairs of black lines, white gobies from the genus Eleotris, with curved caudal fins and violet spots on the back, wonderful Japanese mackerel from the genus Scomber, with blue bodies and silver heads, glittering azure goldfish, whose name by itself gives their full description, several varieties of porgy or gilt head, some banded gilt head with fins variously blue and yellow, some with horizontal heraldic bars, and enhanced by a black strip around the caudal area, some with color zones and elegantly corseted in their six waistbands, trumpet fish with flute-like beaks that looked like genuine seafaring woodcocks, and were sometimes a meter long, Japanese salamanders, serpentine moray eels from the genus Echidna, that were six feet long with their sharp little eyes and a huge mouth bristling with teeth, etc., our wonderment stayed at an all-time fever pitch. Our exclamations were endless. Ned identified the fish, Conseil classified them, and as for me, I was in ecstasy over the verve of their movements and the beauty of their forms. Never before had I been given the chance to glimpse these animals alive and at large in their native element. Given such a complete collection from the seas of Japan and China, I won't mention every variety that passed before our dazzled eyes. More numerous than birds in the air, these fish raced right up to us, no doubt attracted by the brilliant glow of our electric beacon. Suddenly daylight appeared in the lounge. The sheet-iron panels slid shut. The magical vision disappeared. But for a good while I kept dreaming away, until the moment my eyes focused on the instruments hanging on the wall. The compass still showed our heading as east-northeast. The pressure gauge indicated a pressure of five atmospheres, corresponding to a depth of fifty meters, and the electric log gave our speed as fifteen miles per hour. I waited for Captain Nemo, but he didn't appear. The clock marked the hour of five. Ned Land and Kosai returned to their cabin. As for me, I repaired to my stateroom. There I found dinner ready for me. It consisted of turtle soup made from the daintiest hawksbill, a red mullet with white, slightly flaky flesh, whose liver, when separately prepared, makes delicious eating, plus loin of imperial angelfish, whose flavor struck me as even better than salmon. I spent the evening in reading, writing, and thinking. Then drowsiness overtook me. I stretched out on my eelgrass mattress, and I fell into a deep slumber, while the Nautilus glided through the swiftly flowing black current. End of chapter 14